I was very close to him right to the end. Um, obviously, in terms of the people from ATG, it was kind of, you know, m me and him were the main, like, driving forces with it. Yeah, um, yeah. Especially kind of post-early noughties. People, you know, had to deal with death in different ways. And um, I don't know whether I would have dealt with it like that if I had the kind of option to. Killer, killer, podcast. Killer, killer, official .com. <laughs> you need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Instagram UK Frontline. Beatbox created. Talk about world music and street culture. Killer Coward podcast. Oh, what a pleasure this is going to be. Yeah, lovely stuff. Lovely like these, uh, like these chairs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For the posture. Yes, yeah, that's I mean, right. No slack in the knee. Yeah. <laughs> that's about their only good for, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Coward podcast, Central London or Central as you need to be. Trust me, you don't need to be anybody, uh, anywhere else. What a lovely morning to be doing it as well. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk each and every time. You know, I'm going to say, if you haven't got a television app, you're, sh you're severely missing out on uh, the free goodness of the street culture world, purchasing products, all sorts of stuff like that. Get it free download, Android, iPhone, you yeah? um, know? I'm with a man that needs no introduction, but of course I'm going to give him one. What, what part of my generation of, of young guns of, of an age where, you know, just rethinking and remodelling the whole idea of graffiti in London and uh, to great effect... Um, his crew is synonymous across the noughties. ATG, the man himself, the mighty panic inside the place. Yes, what's going on? Back for the second time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much as well, you know. No, uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Definitely. Telling you, bro, like, mm. the first time was, was a trip. And I think I said before he jumped on, I was like, yo, well, your panic's coming through. And mm. there was just so much conversation. But I think I was a bit green at the time. There's so much I could have asked, but... You know, mm. yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it was it's something I hadn't done for a long time, you know, back then. It was, it was nice to, to sit down and talk things through, but it's, um, like I was saying, it's amazing to see kind of how much your platform's uh, developed and how many more people have got involved and things like that, man. So, yeah, thanks for thanks for shouting me and getting me back. Oh, brother, listen, I, I, I'll, I'll be very real with you. When, when I told people that you were on Off The Jump, it changed, I think it changed perception. But secondly... People were so surprised that you didn't have your face covered. It was yeah. like, everyone was like, yo, he's got it. Yeah. <laughs> he's got it done it without having his face. Everyone was like so surprised. Did you get that? Did you get that feedback? Uh, Sometimes. I mean, I still get it now when people, I'll speak to them, especially people that don't know too much about graph. And they'll be like, I saw your Instagram, why you just have your face on it? And it's like, yeah, like it's, norm it's normal for me because I've done that for a while. And yeah. You know, after I had my case and they know what I write or whatever from back from back then, it's like, you know, if I want to put my face to my name, I will, and mm. you know, that's that's that really. So it's like, uh, yeah, it's not it's nothing that requires too much thought on my part. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's nicer me, to man. be an open book sometimes. You know, if I was super active, like still, then it's a different story. But I'm active in different things. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's on balance, man, because like even now I still see probably some of your legal stuff because it was it actually wasn't too far long. It was long enough, but you know for mm. for the grass to grow. But it's certainly mm. you can see it even now. So this is yeah. good balance at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I like to obviously still still paint here and there. Mm. Um, I I'll, I'll always I'll always paint. You know, yeah. I think some some people when you dedicate so much of your life to it at a certain time or you respect how much it's influenced and informed your life, both creatively, your mentality, everything. Mm. I'll always go back. I'll always, graph's always there. I'll never stop writing. Do you know what I mean? I'm highly unlikely. But, um, you know, it's, it, what, one of the, the really cool things about right now is, is how, uh, like, how healthy the scene is in London. For real. How many people are painting. Um never seen anything like it you know mm. in my lifetime in london um it's it's how kind of i always wished it was like don't get me wrong the early noughties and the late 90s 
was an incredible time for Graf. It was really good. You yeah. know, if you came to London then, you'd be like, yes, yeah, it's, it's smashed. There's people yeah, yeah. pushing pushing the boat out. Mm -hmm. um, but then a long, long period of, of it being like Bleak. heavily, yeah, 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 yeah. Heavily um, kind of oppressed, really, <laughs> truly. Yeah, yeah. You, can you oppress graffiti? The, the industrial <laughs> age of... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so now it's like actually... There's lots of times, right, in the last 10 years or so, um, 10, 15 years, where um, I might not even really have wanted to paint illegally that much or go out and do things, certain like spots, but you kind of do it because there's not that many other people doing things. And I know there's a lot mm. of other writers who have been around for as long as me will understand what I'm saying, where it's like when it's just too buffed in London and everything's just looking too dead in terms of on the graph side of things you feel obliged to to do to, to paint certain spots because you don't want people coming to london and just being nothing or yeah it just it just it just the energy is just like you don't want the energy to be flat mm. and now it's like really like a relief to sit in a way because people are so active and you know times in the past where someone will contact me from overseas and say oh who's the most active in London at the moment, who's up, who's doing what, and like, it, you could count them on one hand, easy, yeah, 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 and yeah, now yeah. it's like, I can't, I can't even, I start saying a few names, and I'm like, oh, no, it's that person, that person, and it just goes on and on yeah, and on, yeah, and, yeah. It, and, it, and it's it's cool, because it's like, yeah, it's it's just, uh, you know, for someone who's been doing it for a, a while now, you yeah. know, um, and it, likewise, seeing people that have been doing it for a lot longer than me, mm. popping back up, mm. and going at it, it's oh, great. Yeah. It's great. It's almost Sorry. like uh, it inspires. It's again the 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 evolution, the momentum builds again, and yeah. the people from back there comes in, and it it does because look at the level of when things were getting buffed a lot, right? Um, let's say from like two thousand and five to two thousand and fifteen, solid ten years, right? Mm. When things were getting buffed a lot, um, so during that time, right, to tie it in with the kind of like political atmosphere, n neoliberalism was in full effect. So we'd had the Blair years, who's kind of like, you know, really pushed that, that kind of centrist, uh, sanitised everything quite a lot, you yeah. know. Um, and and then kind of moving forward with, with Gordon Brown and even with uh, Cameron and the uh, Lib Dem coalition, it's a type of politics which it it, it doesn't want the the messy parts of subcultures. Yeah. So oh, that's what, do you know what I'm saying? So it's like... Schooling. Yes. Yeah, so basically... <laughs> True. With graph, with with grime music, what you saw happen, right, was the early noughties, grime exploding. Yeah. A very raw thing all around London. It was... It had serious edge and momentum yeah. to it. And likewise, graph throughout the whole 90s and early noughties, same ways. They kind of... I guess it was on the build-up to the Olympics... Um, they sanitized London. They wanted to sanitize London, That's basically, right, protect yeah. it so that like they can win the Olympic bid. Furthermore, when the tourists come on, in two thousand and twelve, everything's all nothing to see here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So what they did was obviously buff all graffiti across yeah. London, everything, and anyone doing it would get you know heavily fund a, a graffiti task force to catch anyone doing it. Yeah, and throw them in prison or land them, you know, hefty sentences or whatever. Mm. Um, while at the same time kind of celebrating street art, right? Um, so I've always had love for aspects of street art. You know, I've always thought it, it, it's got a, a clear place That's right, in yeah. the cultural um, landscape. But what they did is they thought this is palatable. This is uh, broadly appealing Therefore, we will celebrate that in the Guardian and we'll do shows in the Tate Modern and we'll make an allocated street art area in Shoreditch, et cetera, et cetera. But throw people guilty of the same crime in prison if it's because it's too edgy, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of like want, wanting to appear liberal and woke and all mm, of that, mm. but not actually supporting the grassroots culture and... <laughs> trying to basically trample because people like getting into grime or graffiti that's people who 
are trying to express themselves on a street level. Working class. Yeah, it's these people who just basically, yeah. that's the thing that they, they have, you know. And obviously people from all walks, walks of life are involved in it. But fundamentally, it is for people who want to express themselves, who don't have um, the resources or the opportunity or the desire in one way or the other to yeah. go down a kind of like established it's it's, well, it's cheap to enter it, you yeah it doesn't take much for you to get involved of and course. if you're on a, in, in a in a class sense you just you can jump in at any point exactly yeah um and so like long long way around what my point was is that um during that whole period people doing graph graph still knowing that it would get buffed knowing that it was like it just heavily kind of criminalized and all the rest the level of stuff was often quite like poor do you know what i mean yeah. because you don't have anything to inspire you out there in terms mm. of graffiti graffiti um so you'd have people pop up doing really imaginative things like that like type was a good example rest in peace yeah you know? rest like, in peace yeah. he really yeah, yeah, came yeah. out of nowhere and did all that stuff yeah. you had people different people like there's other other names out there um, and there was this, there was always the people that never stopped keeping going in the background but new kids coming in and certain things it was just this like real like low level of graffiti and timing what, is also an, a, a part of it as well because the the the, the bur burgeoning kind of camera culture where uh -huh. everything had a you know you had a, like a, what was it but arguably like 20 seconds to quickly throw something up before you, you it's just hot yeah it's just like you had the terrorism thing going on at the same time yeah, yeah, so yeah. like basically there was huge amounts of funding for surveillance, huge amounts of funding for cleaning up graffiti and putting people in prison and all of that. Um, and an increasing lack of funding for like youth services. Mm. And, you know, so it was all just... Uh, I really look at that period. Now I've got hindsight on it. I can see why, like, ATG, how we came into it and what the kind of the 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 um the landscape cultural landscape and politics and all of that was like at that time and and how it was affected and all these different things it was quite i actually think it was quite a dark time for london culturally mm. i think like from like the mid late noughties you know almost like a 10 year kind of um uh period and um and i think what's amazing about now I mean, just these things that are like on a political side, it, it, in my opinion, are really bad about now. The increased kind of lack of opportunity and yeah. cutting to to public services and youth services and yeah. all of that's terrible and it's and it's causing misery. Um, but they've stopped cleaning graffiti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, like, you know, and I think like because I'm not comparing the two. Do you know what I mean? These are isolated mm. things. Um, but graffiti has been allowed to flourish. All right, and. For good or for bad, it's meant that it is a much more positive scene, mm. a lot more creative scene for people to get into now, yeah. you know, because it's like, and I think it's important to still push the import, like graffiti and that culture to the younger generation um, who might increasingly get more involved in like organized crime, essentially, you know, on a low level. Oh, that's um, a good point. So do you think this, this, because I was about to suggest or add to, to what you're saying mm. that perhaps there is a generational shift in people's tolerance in 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 all industries of graph under, now over the decades, them understanding that, yeah. hey, maybe we're in a transitional phase here where street art is accepted, so how can we not allow for yeah, that? Yeah, well, exactly. It's a good, it's a good point because... You know, I was talking about the kind of the negatives of that like period of, of neoliberalism politics and and the effect it had over street culture. Mm. Yeah, but it backfired on the people that kind of like pushed that yeah. that card because it made that whole period made um, graffiti very acceptable publicly to people. Yeah, you know, you you have to thank people like Banksy and all the rest mm. in reality for making. Mm it uh, like a, a completely culturally accepted thing totally that's why graffiti and so you take away the funding from the police and uh, you know whatever else graffiti's now been allowed to flourish which is how it always should that's right because it's not totally it, it, it's not um it's not malicious it's not like most people don't have an issue with it you mm. know like you know especially like 
trackside walls, you know, so many spaces where it makes the city look way more interesting, way more colourful. You can see that there is Life. vibrant street culture alive, yeah. you know, and it's like, yeah, I think I'm right in saying that now, like, a lot of police is, you know, like, a lot of police are young. Yeah, that's right. You know, I get if I get pulled over or painting something or whatever in a day, and it's like half the time I'm able to speak to it because they're like younger than me or my age, and it's like mm. you know, it's different. And, and, <laughs> I love and so it. they would have grown up being <laughs> yeah. like as mate, you know, fans as of little, yours. Well, yeah, or as yeah. kids opening up the like the papers like on their kitchen table at their parents' house and stuff about Banksy or Ostremi or Sunate. You know, that's it's so just true. normal. Yeah. So like. I've embraced doing a lot of other things in my life more now. Um, it's not just the fact that London's been painted so much that makes me feel a bit less like anxious about going out and getting up or whatever. There's other, other things in life, um, parenthood, career, whatever. But um, it's definitely, it's just great. It's great to see, mm. you know, in a nutshell, you know, it's... Um, yeah, pure entertainment. Good times to be. Mm. Yeah, pure entertainment. Mm. It's the cat and mouse. It's the cowboys and Indians. It's this shit. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. I mean? Because London's always had that. London's always had its unique style and unique type of, of writer. For which, sure. Which is kind of like, I think, probably became um, most prominent in the 90s, you know, off the back of like, you know, the, the kind of drum and bass era and, you know, squat, yeah. squat raves. Squat raves, and yeah. And just the kind of like uh, solidified London mm. style of things. Where Inbuilt it's, in the culture that, that yeah, of the time. That's yeah, right. like not every place in the world has like a type of person where you look at them or style graffiti and it's like, that's a London writer. And they, they don't get that person anywhere else. Mm. You do have it in, in like various places around the world, of course. But um, London's uh, unique in its way. Mm. Like that. And I think it was frustrating for, for so many years to be known as a city uh, around the world where there's not much graffiti, like mm. people get sent to prison, it's heavily buffed. Yeah. It's not it's not the it's not the graffiti destination. People would come and tour around Europe from America or wherever. And painting. just not even come here. Maybe not come here. Yeah. Really and truly. Mm. And I think um it's frustrating because you know how much potential London graffiti has, the attitudes mm. of people, like it goes right back to like, you know, the the, the punk rock days and every, you know, yeah. very DIY culture that's existed here since mm. forever. And, um, and now it's just good to see things come back in full force, covering all aspects of, of graffiti. Because when things were like not great here, graph wise, and there wasn't so much stuff to see and be influenced by, people would often just pick a certain style or approach to graffiti because why not? You could be, you know... You're what, influenced. that mimicked certain Yeah, you countries. might just be more... Because there's nothing going on all yeah. around you, you might be more influenced by some, like, kind of slightly, like... West Coast your, kind of yeah, style. Yeah, or, like, yeah, weird, wacky, left-field Scandinavian graph yeah, yeah, or, like, yeah, yeah. just New York throw-ups, like... And, um, you know, there's still... That is still part of London graffiti, and it's important for a, a, a graffiti culture to have people doing all different shit, but um, it's... I feel like London graffiti is really back and it's developed in a way where it's picked up things yeah. and it's like, you know, I see certain writers that are kind of doing amazing like trackside pieces um, and it's almost like a mix of like stuff you'd see in the late 80s on panels and tubes and stuff in London, um, but also some kind of futuristic yeah. thing. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, cool, yeah. man. Yeah, it's just a lot of good stuff happening. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and antagonists were the introductory. I, I just felt like this was a this was a forward march on your guys' part. We'll get into that mm. in a second. Mm. But in terms of you, my brother, mm -hmm. panic, dude. And I said it before you came on. Even over the two years since we last chatted on here, mm. you've risen to that higher echelon of uh, style and performance. That kind of it's up there with the Rain Man's, the teachers, the um, the Eins, mm. you know, you're now on this. I appreciate it, man. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. Like identifiably, mm. stylistically, but also mm. in terms of 
professionalism and, and you know, selling art. Yeah, that, you know? yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's good to hear that. Um, you know, like, I've always done loads of different things. I've been somebody that kind of, like, I'm heavily inspired and motivated and, like... I've tried, I've always worked in different things, right? I've had all kinds of random jobs. I never lasted long in anything that's not creative and not um, self-determined, mm. you know? Like, I've wanted to stay in certain jobs, but they've just been like, nah, you know, <laughs> your head's away with the clouds, <laughs> you know? Like, I've just... So, but I like this. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Don't let me go. Yeah, yeah. Get on with everyone here. That's why you feel like a bit of a failure, yeah, knowing yeah. that you were liking stuff because I didn't like you liking yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. But it's like it's um, but it's funny because actually, when I came and did this the, the interview with you last, I was kind of like getting over a few a few demons, you know, um, in my life. Actually, it's probably like kind of free therapy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Broadcast. Talk, talk to me about that. Just, just like realizing there's things in about you that weren't just down to drinking drugs so like having kids basically especially when i had my second kid applied a certain pressure on me um that forced me to knock everything on the head with like you know drinking drugs and that side of things and partying and big up that anybody that's going through because i'm going through that at the moment and big up anyone cause yeah there is an outcome isn't there yeah there's... yeah yeah now good luck to you man yeah, stick man. with it and i think um for me, I never had such an extreme problem with them where it definitely got in the way of life growing up. Um, but I was always able to stop for periods of time on my own. Um, and yeah, but what would happen is like when I had kids, I would try and kind of moderate that lifestyle. But it wasn't possible. I wasn't able to moderate it. So it would always fly off in the wrong direction. And so then I'd be like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to cut it all out. I'm teetotal now. I don't need any drink or drugs in my mm. life. And I'm just going to be this person. Mm. When I would do that, right? And I'd get a couple months, few months into it. And the kind of novelty's worn off. I realized that a lot of the things that were kind of um, in my mind, you know, like kind of, like anxiety or paranoia, like self self-doubt, like overthinking things. They didn't go away. I always put that down to like yeah. the substances, but they didn't go away. And it led it led me to kind of like I ended up being diagnosed with um like ADHD and ADD and I found out a lot about how that's heavily linked to um substances. Wow. Uh and and how it's basically affected me my whole entire life without knowing it. So even school days, I started smoking weed way too young. Way, way too young. And um it was like, I guess I was self-medicating. Yeah. The teachers would always say, oh, he's super bright, um, but he doesn't want to work. I could never focus on an essay. I guess in those times, ADD, ADHD wasn't really a kind of very mainstream discussed thing. So it kind of, whatever, yeah. went went on that way. Um, but in my life, I've always kind of been really driven and I've always taken on lots of projects and then it's kind of, I would never always see them through and things like that, which is another very common trait <laughs> um, to this diagnosis. And it's just interesting because it was shortly after I did the interview with you and I kind of went on a bit of a journey, you know, of like f discovering that, but also um, getting kind of addiction issues under wraps, which I did. And that's amazing. Yeah. No, nah, it was, you know, like... I, 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 I didn't have to do anything too extreme, um, luckily. Mm. And I can still enjoy a drink here and there without going the full way, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So I can't see myself lucky, but I have to always think about it. And going back to what you're saying about my work and kind of the reason it, uh, the reason I was able to, to invest all my time and to get it where it is now was this kind of journey um, back in 2019. Boy. Um, and... What I kind of realized was I've done all these things growing up. I've always, I've always been like entrepreneurial. I've always worked on different things with people. Certain times, uh, you know, if you're an artist, every artist or creative, ultimately they want to be able to just like do what they want yeah. in a studio. 
make paintings, sell them, and that's how they live. Right? Cottage industry, nice and easy, no problems. Yeah, everyone, yeah. that's what you want. Or even if you're a musician, it's the same. You don't mm. want any constraints. You want to mm. make what you want to make and that to be delivered how you want to deliver it. You know it. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So... So basically, that wasn't always feasible. Of course, it's really difficult to, to make that work. You know, it's just like, it's hard work. And you've got to have such a unflinching self-belief. Yeah. You know, you've got to take like years of knockbacks and things like that. And I think like with me, I was just like, you know what? I don't adapt well to being in workplaces. I've tried it, shops, pubs painting decorating i've done i've done loads of stuff it mm -hmm. never i was never able to like adapt to it properly and um i'm when i got fired from like my last pub job that i did i must have been like 21 22 or something like that maybe a bit older actually that's 23 anyway mm -hmm. i was like i'm not gonna go back to doing that i just i know i can kind of make this work you know um being self-employed and just on the creative hustle and from that point i just was open to doing everything, you know, like mm. um, working like clothing, running like DIY brands, trying to do like, like mural work commercially. Um, Just throw everything at yeah, it. Yeah, throw everything at it. Obviously, when I was doing like um, involved with the parties and the clothing with with, with Jan Asset, with ATG. Rest um, in peace, that's and it. And then, yeah, and then, um, and then I kind of, when I had a kid back in like, 2016, I kind of went into like, mm. Uh, what's the word like overdrive with yeah, it, you know yeah. and I was like anything I was open to it I was running a club in like Dalston at one point I got into music management I was managing at Jimothy Lacoste for a little while and then another artist uh, Rhett, Rhett Nichol you managed Jimothy Lacoste huh yeah 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 I was managing him so like, he's doing um, really well for himself yeah he's great man yeah he's, he's a cool, cool guy man so yeah it was fun doing that with him and uh, so and it and it was it was working well and it was kind of essential in terms of like looking after my family and mm. stuff mm. Um, to have all of these different things going on. Yeah, keep the plate spinning. Um, but I kind of just got to a stage where I'd had my second kid. Like I said, had, had passed away. Um, my kid was born like a month after uh, Yan died, and uh, and it all just kind of came to a bit of a head in the sense that like I was very, I realized that I needed to really just focus on myself, you know. Um, it's great collaborating with people mm. on things, especially friends, working on brands or whatever it is. Do you think that masks certain elements of confidence within like, because I know f going forward and doing something on your own takes actually takes a lot of self Ging up and confidence. It, it does, yeah, yeah, C yeah. A bit of courage, it, you know. It does, it does, and also like it's um, I think sometimes it's in my with my story, it wasn't possible to do things alone when I wanted them to. I wasn't mature enough, you know. Mm. When I was doing like shows in the past, I haven't done a show now. I've got one coming up in September, but I haven't done a show since like 2012. I had a few shows between like. 2006, seven, and that's 2012. You know, I was really? trying to always keep my yeah. thing going with that, but it was really difficult, you mm. know, to get into that side of things. And it was partly because I wasn't actually mature enough as a person. My style probably wasn't mature enough. Maybe I wasn't communicating things in the right way. And what happened with so my creative kind of career was always doing lots of different things with different people. And it just came to a stage where I'd learned so much mm. from running brands from managing other artists from just business yeah you know, i just learned so much and i got used to the kind of like the, the, the unreliability and the whole drives hustle. me mad and it but you know you know you get yeah. used to it you adapt to it and i think like um i just at the end of 2019 you know i'd kind of like tackled a few demons and realized that actually when you've got a family to look after and you're working with other people, you can't and you shouldn't expect them to work, be driven in the same mm. way you are. Do you yeah, know what I mean? I do know it's what like you, mean. you need to let people do, obviously you've all got, always got to pull your weight and things like that, but you need to let people work in the way that they work, especially mm. when it's your friends. And I just realised that actually I've learned so much from working with friends and from managing other people, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just going to apply all that to my own thing now mm. because then I can only be like 
pissed off with myself if things aren't going well. Just, you know, just being like totally reliant on, totally. on you and yourself. And also like I'd neglected my own artwork for a long time. <clears throat> and um, yeah, with all that experience working in the creative industry in different places and channeling it back into my own thing with a mature a mature head on my shoulders, that's, that's why it's kind of mm. worked the way it has recently. And, you know, I started 2020 like with a plan to just to, to to do just that do you know what i'm saying to invest all of my time back into my own work and treat myself as the as, as the artist and the, manage myself as an artist yeah yeah, yeah yeah manage myself as a brand whatever, wow. whatever you want to say and that's mad to think in 2020 in a whole year look at all you've kind of achieved in that small space of time yeah you know what it's just like that the important message here what i'm saying is is to try and like conf like always confront your demons. If there's something that's un uncomfortable in your life, you Truth. know, if you've got like anxiety creeping up too much, if you find yourself bitter too often, um, whatever it is, like be check yourself. Be, yeah, check yourself and be kind to yourself, man. You know, like yeah. with me as well, I've always been like somebody who go out my way to help others. Yeah, mm. and I'll always be that way. Mm. There's not much you can do about mm. it. You know, I'm. I'm Whatever. That's 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 how I am. It's and true, by the way. And super punctual, always on time. I said to, <laughs> yeah. I said to the missus before she goes to the gym, I said, get the fuck out early because he's gonna be on time, man. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's just um I think yeah, it's uh to to really be able to kind of take your thing where you want it to, you first need to get yourself happy and in a place where yeah. you're comfortable and really that's all it is because then you, you you're not kind of I used to just be plagued with like self doubt. Do you know what I'm saying? And yeah, kind I feel of, you, bro. you know, like it's just, it's no good, and no one needs that. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Everyone in the world, like, do whatever you want to do, yeah. and don't don't worry about any judgment because it's like people don't actually care. They don't they unless don't. you're not going out your way to fuck with people. Yeah, they care more about themselves. They got more things pressing to think about. Yeah, they're not actually on you at all. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. and it's like. In fact, when they can see that you're insecure, self doubt, or things like that, that's when like people prey on that. Yeah. And actually, when you just go and do your thing, whether it like works how you want or not, people respect that. I respect that. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? I never, really, I never talk down on somebody who's just going out their way to like do it. Whether I like what they're doing or like them, it's like they're doing their thing. Yeah. You live once. You know what I mean? That's so right. I think for me, it was um, coming to that realization. You know, knowing that like I had like a growing family to look after and that helps you kind of prioritize things and not mm. get too caught up in other stuff but um it's not it's not the savior do you know what i mean mm. it's just you still need to work from within so um yeah it's been great you know i, I kind of like re kind of refocused on my own work at the start of 2020 kind of hit the ground running with it and um and it and it did what i wanted it to mm. you know in the sense that like you know, I got signed up by a gallery, Red 8 Gallery, and they're moving my work. Um, Big that up every time. Yeah, which is great. And yep. just like, just the satisfaction of, um, you know, making making paintings that are like personal to you and getting that out of your system on a regular basis and having them received well, you know, is um is great. So it's, it's fantastic. You know, just staying focused on it, really. It's a contrast, actually, if you don't mind me saying, mm. compared to the first podcast. Mm. Um, I didn't want to, uh, and in retrospect, it's only after the fact I thought about it. I was like, oh, maybe that's why. But I didn't bring up the subject of asset. Mm. I didn't bring up the subject of a particular time, which was mm. actually really reasonably close yeah. to when we had the podcast. Yeah. And some of me was like, oh, respectfully, I'm glad we didn't get mm. it because it's your podcast. Mm. But on the flip side, I thought to myself, well, moving forward, I think I'd like to address it and yeah, talk no, to you about course. it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it was a real... Yeah. I no, think look, for everybody it was... Yeah, man. He's an incredibly important um, person mm. in my life and um, influenced so many people. And, you know, it's a, it's just a strange thing. You know, anyone who's um, lost a friend that close to them will relate. It's... Um, something that goes in in waves mm. you know how you feel about it and whether you you know sometimes you think you've come to a 
like a, a safe place with it or mm. some kind of conclusion. But you never you never really do, you know, and I think that's just the nature of losing someone that that was that close to you. Um that's that's, that's all it is. And I think uh but he you know, the the thing to the thing that I always kind of hold close with with Asset is how much he kind of inspired and influenced people, mm. um, how much energy he had. Um, you know, he was a real, like, trailblazer in, in many ways. Um, and, yeah, he was a madman, you know? <laughs> he was, like, in the best <laughs> way possible, he was, he was, he was crazy. He was mm. a true eccentric mm. mad genius, mm. you know, with, with regards to his, um, with his creative release, you mm. know, and everything he, he was about he was, he, he was hilarious uh and yeah i think um a, a, a part of it for me was um was again just uh allowing myself to uh have a bit of space to reflect which is natural mm. you know mm. um because yeah you know it's uh when something like that happens, it sends shockwaves you know, mm. across the like, community. And um, you know. and everybody kind of grieves at the same time. Yeah. It doesn't always give you... Because being so close with them in the same crew, growing mm. up together, doesn't doesn't give you a lot of time to gather your own thoughts? Yeah, 100%. I mean, that's, that's kind of where I was going with this, is like uh, some people who are really close with us here, mm. we're able to, um, when the news like broke, we're able to, to basically like s sign out, you know, mm. just it's up to them. You don't have to talk to people. If you don't want to you go and like sort your head out, you know, yeah. um, a lot of people did that and I saw them at the funeral and, and that's that. And it's like, that's fine. You mm. know, it's got nothing to do with how much they loved them, how close they were with yeah. it. It's just people, you know, had deal with death in different ways. And um, I don't know whether I would have dealt with it like that if I had the kind of option to, but I didn't. I didn't mm. You know, it wasn't, the option wasn't clear for me. It was like, I was very close to him right to the end. Um, obviously, in terms of the people from ATG, it was kind of, you know, m me and him were the main like driving forces with it um yeah, yeah especially kind of post early noughties when you know the, the original kind of lineup of atg disbanded slightly people went on to different things and it was yeah. me and me and asset from from that stage onwards were the one who always kind of still shared it shared the vision and had ideas of how we can kind of keep pushing things forward and you know um Obviously, like all the uh, the others, played very important mm. roles too. But when he passed, there was that people wanted answers from me. Do you know what I mean? It's like my phone's blowing up. That and figures, of course. It's not about me. You mm. know, it's like the most important people to think about at the time was you know his mom and his dad and his yeah. sister and things. Um, naturally, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's just a. I definitely kind of started processing it more maybe like a year or so after he died. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Because it's just kind of like, yeah, just just it in there with him, you know? And, uh, mm. but yeah, nice. No, it's just, obviously, it's a huge loss. Yeah, and it's that's a, a huge loss. loss. And I think um, I often wonder about, he's somebody, everyone will have that person in their life, but they might not know it's that person until they're gone is that there's some people who, when something happens in the news or within a certain scene, <laughs> just something like there's only a handful of people you can contact to crack jokes about it mm. or to rant about things. Yeah, 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 yeah. And actually, like, he was maybe, like, he was maybe... I've got, obviously, different friends and people who, like... When I notice something within like music, I'll message them and I know that they will yeah. know every single reference that I'm talking about and they know the, the funny side yeah, of every yeah. single part of it. Yeah, yeah. But Asset was somebody who who knew so much about 
stuff across the boards culturally and in, and in the world because our families shared similar politics um we're both activists mm. you know um in different ways so me and asset had that just understanding like that like base level kind of shared views on like the world in that sense but then we grown up together through in northwest london through so many different times mm. you know like from the late 90s up to when he died um you know at the end of uh 2017 time flies doesn't it time flies Jeez. and it's like there was just so much within that race it's like he was the person that i'd always just like even if we'd been bickering or whatever which we did a lot like i'd always go back to him it basically the, the, the ice would be broken you know, by just mm. one little text about some little bands. It's like, ah! Yeah, it's like, you can never stay pissed <laughs> off at each other. And yeah. We accepted the fact that we were, like, um, very opposing characters. We both, yeah. were both big characters. There mm. often wasn't enough room for us. We were different and we had friction, but we respected that over time. Mm. And, like, it just is what it is, you know? That's, that's just, for me, that's what kind of makes somebody, like, Almost more than a friend, it's like a brother because you don't don't drift in that way. You yeah. don't do something that you don't have a falling out over something, and that's that. Yeah. You might fall out over something and you cool off for a few months, mm. but then it's like you're too you're too kind of like spiritually like connected and yeah. you share too much of a like a vision and and the history and all the rest. So with him, is that's what's been always difficult for me is just not having that person to like. <clears throat> fire fire off you know like texts and and like catch up on things so for instance for the first year or so after we died i was like you know what i'd always say to my wife like there's nothing that's going on right now that yan would be surprised of nothing he hasn't seen before you know like okay. it's funny I f it's funny to how like time doesn't move that much or thing cultural things don't move that much yeah right but then there was a point maybe like a year or so ago where it's so much has happened, mm. you know, because when the last conversation I had with him actually was talking about um, some of the writers that were active who'd started like painting a lot of um, full colour pieces like Force and Enter mainly, mm. um, really going for it. And we were just saying, yeah, it's, just, it's sick to see because it just reminds us of... Um, what we were doing, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. Before and like, like technical-ish, you know, yeah. full colour pieces yeah. on tracks. Like, and that was like right before he died um, with that conversation. And since then on the graph front, like obviously it's exploded um, in recent years. And I'd love to, to see what he would do right now you know he would really like he would have jumped in both feet yeah right? he would have been <laughs> losing his mind yeah like i really wish he was yeah. here to put his bit in um but also just like coronavirus like the world like mm. everything is just gone so accelerated and yeah. futuristic and blah 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 it's like dystopian and He's somebody who's like commentary on it. It would have been amazing. You know, mm. there's just some people who like. Yeah, bro, I uh, feel yeah. you. Mm. Uh, time is just a constant, isn't it? And mm. I rest in peace to all of more recently, of course, Jano and these writers that have contributed so much yes. to the scene. Yeah, yeah, losing, losing too many, you know. And I don't yeah. know whether it's it's been like that in the past or not, but it's uh, really from. After Jan died, just just loads, man. Yeah, that's you right. You know, like a, a pal and Veko yeah. and you yeah. know, like like Ty mm. and obviously Lover uh, and yeah. Trip and K Bag, K -Bag, K -Bag yeah. was like very soon after Jan died, less yeah. than six months after. Um, it's just a lot, you know. Dren recently, mm. like um, you know, it's it, a lot of a lot of writers. Um, going way too soon and a lot of just a lot of a lot of people you know um in this you know over the last year and stuff so yeah. it's uh it's just you know it's hard on people's mental state I think, yeah i moment, think you're right there's not enough of a 
of a distraction yeah. or a release. So it's um Look after yourselves, people. Yeah, for real. Yeah, yeah. Look after look after yeah. yourselves and and kind of make sure you look out for people, you know. Hundred percent. Sometimes the, the the least expected. Well, while we're on the subject, well actually no, let's let's reset here. Mm. Because for the, for those that don't know of the ATG era, mm-hmm. I think uh, can you break down who who was essentially in ATG? Um, so because I got big up to Snore man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Snore was so it was. Um, Snore was one of my bro. Like you, I think it's a combination of you three and the periphery of my mind. Yeah, just his contribution, in my opinion, up against you guys. Yeah. The dynamics were crazy. Yeah, you used yeah, to love that. Yeah, yeah. Three's the magic number. Yeah, man. <laughs> um, so originally it was me. Rest and harm, right? So we all went to school together, mm-hmm. and we've been like painting for a, f- a couple of years, a few mm. years um, before ATG started. And then you had uh, uh, Asset, Snore, and Raid. Yeah. So it was it was actually five of us to start off with. It was it was Asset, Snore, Raid, me and Rest, and and then Harm was. Um, put in shortly after, and that was like the original lineup mm. of it. Um, and how did it begin? How did that it, it begin? Begun, it really begun because <coughs> we were like individually the new the new school. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It was like. DDS was still alive and well. A lot of the um, the crews from the nineties were alive and well, mm. but they'd been around a minute by this point. Yeah, yeah. And there was a lot of writers that were more kind of the the youngers of the pre existing crews from the nineties, mm. let's say, mm-hmm. and uh, going down that school. You also had the Toxes and the Cuts and the Zerks and the... You had loads of people. You had DPM in yeah. South. You had the, there was For a sure. whole new yeah, yeah. a whole new wave, Yeah, really, of graffiti. So, yeah, I mean, there's going to always be way more people that kind of I fail to mention in these things, and it's not to do with who was mm. active. Just in my mind, this is just me kind of speaking. At the time, it was like... ATG was forming, DPM mm-hmm. itself was forming, RT in West was forming, AS in Northwest um, was forming, Tox was actually coming through with like CGO mm-hmm. in West and also kind of Myth. Yeah, There's just some um, serious knowledge that's going on, right? You, it doesn't seem like you're missing and, anyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> you're like, doing all right. Doing all right, yeah. yeah. Myth and Element, yeah. and there was that kind of uh, scene going on yep. as well, like tube focused. Yep, yep. Um, and then when these things all kind of like matured into what they were, you know, Tox was a, a force of his own. Crazy. He like, might have kind of started with different people yeah. but he became just ozone as well right ozone yeah. came a little bit after yeah um you had ozone and yeah and then like people like add it mm-hmm. was a bit that was a bit down the line mm-hmm. um but we came around as a as a, the, the the new school mm. really and me and rest had kind of started to get a little name for being writers from the area that were like Getting about, mm. you know, we were just we were painting just kind of like simple dubs. I like Rest Star. I thought he was fantastic. Yeah, no, he was you know great, I mean? man. But you know, like me and Rest, like, um, I really wanted to be able to just do like the, the sick, simple, silver dubs. I did start getting influenced by a bit of like um other little like Euro things that I would see, yeah, in magazines see and things like that. Like quite early on, um, I always loved like. Uh, French graffiti, but really and truly, me and Rest were people that were just we hadn't thought about like huge blockbusters or emulsion pieces yet, <laughs> yet, yeah. And so we were getting up, and then Snore and Raids were getting up. Snore was making a big impact, but he was at the time as well, just doing kind of like outlines, really slick outlines, not mm. even filled in sometimes on key spots. Um, 
really well placed spots. So they were doing their thing, Snow and Ray's like more on a bombing thing. Um, and then you had Asset, and me and Rest met Asset in uh, Finchley Road car park outside the home base, <laughs> which used to be a big spot for for Racky and probably still with fuck knows, but um, that's where we were going like steel paint. And we met him outside there, and he was like, "What? You look right, yeah, you know <laughs> all that sort of thing." Yeah, and, and uh, sniffing, sniffing scent kind yeah, of. Yeah, but it was funny, and he like even then we were like fifteen. He had this like kind of boss persona, you know, and he was mm. like, "He's like, oh, come see, come around into the alleyway. I'll show you some of my stuff." And he'd done like these almost like wild style outlines mm. in the in the alley. It used to be called Sense Alley because there was a the sense down there, um, and. And he was like, for our age, was incredible at graffiti. You know, like his tag was just next levels. Never seen anything like it. Could not believe that a kid could do such an incredible tag. It had like a real, it's very West London in this like decorative style. So much flair to it. Um, Sick. Yeah, because he'd been schooled by people like SHK and VFL and, you know, these um, kind of like real stylers from West. He just had a real like natural talent, but also had been schooled by a lot of um, the old school around Kilburn. And um, so he... And then we all used to kind of congregate at this house in Belsize Park. There's this boy called Paul. Hung um, type Paul. Yeah, hung type Paul, yeah, <laughs> who, like, you know, he struggled down the line and um, we'll go into that. But anyway, his house was like a bit of a ma- mad house in the sense that people, like a bit of an open drug market. Obviously, you have to ring on his bell. Mm. But it was like his mum and dad's house is in the, be- the basement. What? And they were just like, you know, those people that just like in denial. Mm. What, what happened to their son? Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. like... If we don't address it, it's not happening. <laughs> Did you kind of, and you kind of walk in there going, "Yes, we know. We know you know." They would we just know. open the door and just give us this kind of like vacant stare and then just kind of wander off into the living room. You know, like oh. it was weird, man. But whatever. When you're like 15, you don't give a shit. No, no, no. no. Can go down there Again, it's only in retrospect you realise yeah, like, yeah, what's going I'm on. Parent, but then I wouldn't be a fucking. I wouldn't do that. So I don't really have that much sympathy for the situation. Yeah, 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 that yeah, is yeah. what it is. <laughs> um, but anyway. Uh, so we, people used to congregate there the whole time. It was it was it was a mad little place, um, and and then it was kind of known that like Snow and Rays would go there. We would cross paths with each other, and Asset was the mutual friend between Snow and Rays and and me and Rest. And then it was just kind of decided like we should do a, have a crew. Mm-hmm. ATG had already something Yan had already um, thought up with friends from his his school likewise there was a you know me and Russ had a little crew at school <laughs> um but the people in uh, you know when you have a little crew at s- school days most of the people aren't into doing graph properly no they just they like the idea do it of it. in the in the, the, the toilets and the yeah, school yeah. desks and around the area and stuff. A lot of it doesn't go past that stage, does No, it doesn't it? go past that stage. And so we basically just decided to... There was never really a question. Yam was like, yeah, we're doing ATG. We're not mm. taking your little crew. Like, ATG sounded better. We had the better mm. kind of, like, antagonizers and yeah. all sick. the rest. So it was like... And you had the logo, the whole kind of A with the G. Yeah, that, yeah, that yeah exactly. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it started, man. And then it was just, like, I would say about five years well four, no four years just solid mm. solid painting solid painting what yeah. did you, would you go out like how many times a week would you go out all the time all the time all the time man you know like I, I think it was to do with just the type of um, people we were but also like you know Jan had his little base I had my my base and Really, we were just kind of like free to do what we wanted to do. Do you know what I mean? And we never like. Wasn't your parents were chill? No, our parents were always cool, cool with it. Mm. You know, and it was like, I think, I don't know. I've, I, I don't know whether I would be the same. No, yeah. With my kids now, but I think it's because London's a different place, maybe. But you know, we were always allowed to roam around mm. London from when we were really young, so. 
come the time we like 15, 16, it was like we really could treat it like a full time job and like, you know, so and that's what we did really. Um and and it and we had a big impact and we pushed we pushed the boat out and I think um it was you know, some people at the, at the end of that kind of era, let's say like by, by 2006, um, yeah, a couple of people just stopped. That like rest and raid really just stopped. For what happened to reasons. yeah? What happened to those guys? Like, did I heard I got I got a whiff that maybe Snore had moved to Brighton? Yeah, yeah. So something. Snore went to around those times, 2005. He moved to Brighton to study um, like illustration and, and do the art thing. Um, he was still painting down there, but you know he was obviously investing a lot of time mm -hmm. in like like his artwork. And and Raids um just like got on pursuing a career. You know he went into to film. Really? Yeah, he went to film. Um, worked his way up in in that industry, and you know yeah. I think he's doing really well with it to this day. But kind of lost lost touch years ago. Um, and and Rest he did a lot of traveling, and then kind of got into like Buddhism and like yeah, nice you know, spirituality. Yeah, yeah. And, but you know he really he really kind of. Mm -hmm. went down that path and lived in different places across the world for he's only just moved back to the UK um, really now this year from and from about 05 he'd he'd been going around the world MIA like, just doing his thing yeah man yeah like you know kind of retreats and studying buddhism and tibetan studies at certain mm -hmm. times um so and then and then it was kind of yeah, at that time, I I started trying to focus on artwork and you know painting, you know what you would label street art, I guess, um, as well. Um, so I yeah. just just experimenting with that and getting into just other things. I always wanted to be a, an artist, you know. I always mm. wanted to have a creative career. That was my that was my dream, and so I just kind of um, set about that. But I I always me and Asset I always kept painting you know we never yeah. stopped doing graffiti um but yeah it was just atg is as a graffiti crew solely like an organized graffiti crew super organized was a five-year window can, we, can i just talk about because i did mention this in the podcast before and you know we're further down the line now you know yeah. it'd be hard push to find it if you typed it in so this is a, you know we're going to refresh on a few bits here uh a atg man like d d dominant in and ruffled feathers as well from what i remember you yeah. know there was certainly some like yeah you know, yeah people didn't like people us. Had the hump yeah <laughs> and but but i kind of like you know there was something about that because what happened over a period of time is people's opinions changed the more you were it was almost like repetition was key and, yeah and and, and yeah, I, yeah. I just used to I, I was always fascinated um and i think it came from the um the standards that you guys had set yourselves because whenever you would see uh, the ATG symbol, or yeah. you'd see you guys doing a, you know, blockbuster together, or you know, track sides, wherever. I you would, it's just the attention to detail. It looked like the the intention was more color. Yeah. Even if it was a dub, more whiter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if it's, if everything more. And yeah, no, we were trying to <laughs> type, we were trying to kind of push things. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? And I think, you know, ultimately, right. In like, you got to remember, we came in at when the kind of like like bad boy London writer was such a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like the nineties really cemented the idea of a like all city bad boy writer. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's it was something that people um, followed and to varying degrees, like. Not everyone was wanting to definitely be that, mm. but a lot of people were. We've come in now. Um, don't get me wrong. I was heavily influenced by that mm. sort of thing. And in my school, you had like local, like they're more like like gangs really, um, but they all they graft. Mm. So I'd grown up around. The proper rude boy writers. Know, big up yeah, people who, that still do that now, you know, like, of, whole time. Of course, yeah. it's such an important part of Thousand London, percent. like graffiti and, you know. Street culture, yeah. Street culture, man, you sure. know, and, and I think it's, uh, but ultimately, I we come from a different place. Mm. You know, we were like, 
regardless of our differing backgrounds and things like that, um, we were the skaters, some of us. Um, we were the people who were maybe more interested in graffiti when we got into it because of the amazing wild styles that you would see mm. and all of that um, than just getting a name and being mm. like, you know, that kind of like, that guy on road who's, who who paints, he's got mm. a tag, but he just wanted to stay at that, you know? So it's like, when you're the kind of people like we were, really there wasn't that many people like us going that hard. Mm. That's what it came down to. Athleticism, so, you, had the, you had complete and utter conviction. Basically, it was that. Yeah. And so it was very hard to, at the time, to keep up with us for, for one reason or another. And at that stage, you can either give us our props or you can find a reason to, <laughs> to discredit what we're doing. Mm. Oh, they're this, they're this, they're this and that or blah, blah, mm. blah. And it's like there was just so much kind of like uh, Chinese whispers and all these kind of things going on where it was just like really and truly what it came down to is that we weren't, people pref would prefer it if we were Aggie and doing all of that mm. at the time because it's just easier to go and a, with. And a different affiliation rather yeah, than... Yeah, yeah. But, you yeah. know, the, the thing is, it's like all those things never mattered to us as a crew. Mm. Certain people from within ATG could have gone more down that route, yeah, right? Or being like that because they, didn't, they know those people, they, they can do that if they yeah, want yeah. to. But that is not... We, we were like... We were very inspired and like intelligent people, you know, mm. who wanted to to use graph as a as a force. So we were trying to impress each other at how far we can take it. That's yeah? the shit. So it's like That's so the, the hate just comes. It's just part of it. It just comes comes with this this thing. But like anything in life, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then as well, it's like we were never really scared to do certain things. So off the back of that, where the hate hadn't really died down. Yeah, we were just like. Some people loved us. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm saying, like everyone hated us. They didn't. You no, know, there, was no, just, no. there was just like a trend of animosity towards us. Early. We're not talking like direct. This was like an early doors. Thing, early doors really. thing. Yeah. But before, like we'd even like that was still there. I started like painting like char characters and street art things, mm. right? And then we started like making clothes and doing raves. And all these things at the time were controversial as well. So it just wound people up. Oh, fucking so loud, started doing clothes and mm. doing crossovers and all of that kind of talk. But it's like, listen, when you don't, when when you're used to people just hating from the jump anyway for bullshit yeah. because of how much you're doing it, you don't care. You're like, well, look, man, if I want to do that. Makes you do it more, doesn't it? I'll do it. Well, it's just like, you just get used to just being like, oh, well, people just mm. can think yeah. what they want to think, you know? Like, you're only ever selling out if you're selling out to yourself. Mm. If you're compromising what you're about, then yeah, like, you know, cool, maybe you can be labelled something. But for us, it was like, no, no, we want to do raves and we want to yeah, like, yeah. make t-shirts and we want to have people wearing t-shirts at raves. And you're being talked about as well. You know, it's like what Nas said, it's, Nas once said, well, it's like, okay, they don't like my stuff sometimes, they like my stuff other times, but it's better than not being talked about at all. Yeah, you need people to push things forward. Yeah. It's like, you know, the, yeah. the, um, the controversial ones um, who like, you know, like test the water with stuff mm. and, and like get it in the neck. Mm. They're pushing things forward, yeah. whether you think it or not. Do you know what I mean? It's just like um, but yeah, it was just like it's, you know, ATG is it's, it's a moment in time. It's you know, it's a beautiful. It was time. a part. It was a part of everything. You and know? it made and, and it created also. It created um, a lot of um. Uh, affiliates like uh, that AI, AI and T clothing and yeah. urban nerds and yeah. all these kind of um, uh, I don't know for their time yeah for me they they epitomized an attitude and from the graph point of view you yeah. guys definitely were spearheading that with club nights like you say yeah, and all yeah. these things well you think like um, you know I'm not too schooled up on the ins and outs of um. UK streetwear and event. I mean, I know a lot about what was going on in the 80s and 90s, of course. And but you had the t-shirts. You rocked the t-shirt, the 80s yeah, and t-shirts, no? I didn't live through all of the kind of, obviously, the 80s and 90s. I was, I was young. Um, I was born in 86, so mm -hmm. yeah, I remember the 90s clearly as a, as a child. But what I can say from, like, the, the early noughties onwards is that when we started branching out into different things, 
there was a real wave of like DIY culture um, in in the UK. You know, mm. like brands like Trap Star, if you think how far they've gone now, you had A&T. Yeah. Um, Urban Nerds was a, a night, you know, that went on to become an agency and all the rest. And mm. There was so many people basically crafting careers for themselves out of street level things, right? Mm. From, and that wasn't something that there was a, a manual for mm. at the time. So we were one of the few people who'd stepped over from, in this country, had stepped over from Graf, kept the same brand name and being like, we're going to go and do this with it now. Yep. Um, but that's why we were like affiliated with people like A and T or Urban Nerd or who whoever at the time, you know, there was just we had um uh Rogue Status and, and DTA out in LA, um, who was a, a DIY, you know, brand, mm. you know, inspired by a kind of different street level like cultures. And so it was kind of the emergence of of that which is now totally commonplace yeah because now it's like it's amazing how alive and real graffiti is it's like the essence of graffiti right now in london but mm. as well people are branching out from it and using it as like taking the energy and the confidence that they built from graffiti to become a tattoo artist or to become a uh, photographer mm. um documenting things around so true it's like Looking back, I totally can see how certain people would have fallen into the the the, the trap of hating on us, mm. right? Because you got to remember that people were people were struggling to keep real graffiti alive at that mm, time. That's right. Because of what I was talking about, the heavy buff and like the politics of the world and all the rest, and so it was easy to be like, oh, you're like, you know, mm. you're crossing over and blah, mm. blah, blah. But it's like, I've been doing, living real graffiti since I was a kid, mm. all right? Since I was 12 years old. And actually, when it came to a time where we, I started making more art and things like that, and we started kind of branching to the rays and the clothes, it was partly because there wasn't enough of a of a of a association, scene. Like an association. there wasn't enough of a like a, a, an alive scene at that time to keep us totally committed to that mm. do you know what? we were in graph because it's like we done our thing all right and like if we wanted to pack it in and never do anything again that's all there is to it yeah people come they contribute and they have a keep contributing keep contributing and keep contributing which is amazing or they stop, or they move on to something else. And it's, it's as simple as that we'd done everything that we wanted to do in terms of, like, London graffiti and how we saw ourselves um, dominating things or whatever whatever we managed to do during that era is what we wanted to do. There wasn't anything we are like, oh, but we never, ever, like, did yeah. this or that. So, like, it's just a natural thing. You just, it like... It felt like you had actually completed the course. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, we got the we got the GMVQ yeah, yeah. in the bag, yeah. and I got big up also. Like while we're on the subject of innovating and moving things forward, and mm. also getting a bit of slack for it as well. Big up Trap House, but, yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean, because like yeah, he's, yeah. he's he's a, there's elements of what he goes through sometimes in terms of public opinion that you you've basically explained right there. You know, I, I had him in mind when I'm talking about this stuff mm. because he's somebody who doesn't care. Mm. He's just doing his thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all there is to it. Yeah, and it's like. If you don't like something the way it's done, go and do something mm. different or d display how you think things should be done mm. properly. Mm. But, you know, it's just uh, everything is... Everyone plays an important role in in this culture, you know, and I think, um, you know, across across the board. But, but yeah, yeah, I think... Um, where was I going with it? It's all. It was just all part of the the journey. But I think you know that like there was a a strange time in London where 
graffiti was really demonized and removed and imprisoned mm. and street art was celebrated and it did create a the massive divide because for sure it made the people who wanted real graffiti to stay alive i've always played both i've always one foot in mm. one foot you know whatever you're a fan you love yeah, this I like, shit yeah you know like I, yeah. I kind of i'm into it all um i definitely my roots are graffiti I'll never say I'm a street artist. I'm a graffiti writer that has moved on to make art. We need more people like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a more common thing in other countries. Yeah. You know, like there isn't really like a stigma attached to it. But because in other countries, they didn't have that massive divide created mm. by politics and society. Mm. You know, like in Paris, in New York, in lots of places, writers who are just graffiti writers then progress into making artwork. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily street art because they're graffiti writers mm. you know and, and i think here going back to that era it we were forced to separate mm. by politics by a brand of politics that was going to be like you're going to go to prison if you tag on the tracks and the trains and whatever yeah yeah and you're going to be in the guardian supplement if you paid something <laughs> in shoreditch and you're going to yeah, get yeah, yeah. A, a show in a nice gallery and everyone's going to applaud yeah so that made graffiti writers obviously furious you know and more aggressive more aggressive yeah. like it became a, a battle and and so i see where some of the train of thought came with like animosity towards like us or banksy or whatever people that would like not graph graph but ultimately everything just had its place and mm. now you can see how everything has its place yeah. when you look at graffiti in london now yeah the way it's all developed built up stacked up ladder things pieces rollers above that this that people bombing with faces now is there as much of a differentiation between graffiti and street art maybe not because Whoa, of how yeah do you know what i mean because mm. of how developed it is um, there's no line for it. Uh, I mean, of course, there's subject to debate because, you know, there's the hardcore and then there's the, uh, the yeah. creatively, you know, street art extreme. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah there's a there's a middle ground, which you're talking about, where yeah. the transferal of skills, as long as your integrity is intact, you can do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's more of a, it's a party where everyone's invited at the moment. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, as long as, like, people aren't taking each other out but the same applies across the board but you know like i i, I think it's amazing if you see because where we're at now is that like all right track side space and certain wall space is is um there's not much of it basically no. and so people are squeezing things in also people know that if you don't paint paint something proper regardless of who you are really you might get blown out by someone who wants to paint something proper you know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, you know, so it's things are really like densely packed. There's a lot of stuff going on, and I think therefore shit will get off the pot, could, basically. Yeah, man. Be it was good. Just like, Boom. Yeah, it's just I don't think there's as much different. Even the fact that people like myself and teach are, and there might be others who have come from a, a, a graph graph background and are being recognised as artists yeah, yeah, yeah. while bypassing the street art kind of institutions yeah. and scene. Yeah. That's a sign of how things have progressed. And that's kind of thanks to street art mm -hmm. because for a long time, people that were buying paintings and they wanted urban art, they wouldn't, they're not interested in somebody that had like a history of bombing or Guanul City. That didn't mean anything to them. They just wanted to know that, like... Because the language was, wasn't there. They just didn't know about that culture, mm. you know? It was like, pe a lot of people learned about graffiti culture from street art. They mm. got interested in street art because it was sold to them by the establishment, by the media, um, as a kind of cool... They wanted to keep London cool, right, for the Olympics, but they didn't want it to be crimey. You're kicking some game right now. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like they've sold that to people... But like I say, it's a little bit of a backfire because a lot of people have then learned what graffiti is off the back of that. They've been documenting street art and then, oh, actually, graffiti is kind mm. of cool and then it's all developed. And now, you know, people just look at... People look at the 
paintings for what they are. I think really people who like collect my work, so they see an ab an abstract artist, a, a painter who's come from like uh, a graffiti background, more or less. Mm. They might say street art background, but that's irrelevant. They mm. can see on my Instagram or whatever that I paint letter form graffiti and I've got a history of doing that. That hasn't put them off. That's probably interested certain people. For the story, the, back, the yeah, background. Yeah, it's just opening people's eyes to like, oh, like not all the people that do letter form graffiti and tagging are like just vandals, pure vandals or lead doesn't like lead to other crime. You mm. know, like a lot of writers are involved in other things, you know, outside of it. And, but they would anyway. Graffiti hasn't made them do that. Do you know mm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Graffiti writers are people that want to bend the rules. They like, they don't look at the world as... Yeah, yeah. They, they pick the rules. Super interesting. Well, you know... It, most it, interesting it, people on the planet, man. Well, it's like, you know... It, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them is funny. I was talking about the um, ADHD and ADD, and when I went for a meeting with one of the doctors after being diagnosed, and they asked me what I did, and I said oh, I'm an artist, and okay, what kind? I was like, well, originally I come from a graffiti background, and and then and then the doctor he started like smiling and nodding, and I was like, yeah, like what? Why is that? What's that about? Why are you smiling? And he's like, you wouldn't believe how many people I treat. Like graffiti artists, graffiti people. No way. Yeah, and like we got into talking about it, and he's like, "Yeah, his theory was that it's um obviously you're highly impulsive if you've got ADD and ADHD, and so therefore you just act a lot without really like kind of thinking it through, but also the kind of the repetitive tagging thing is a bit of a con a control. You're under uh you're in control if you can. You're doing that, doing that. It becomes the the focus. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like you know. Obviously, not every graffiti writer is going to be on the spectrum of that, but um, it's interesting. Uh, it was interesting to hear that from the, from the doctor. Wow. Um, but what was I saying just before that? I said I'm off on a tangent. Um, we were talking about... Um, he's nearly there, he's nearly there. It's Jesse, gone. you're getting it's your gone. value right now, <laughs> people, I swear to God. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, so anyway, I think... Um, that learning of this ADHD thing yeah. is like night... I have to say it again, compared to the last podcast we have, this is like night and day. The, the mm. game you're kicking right now, the, comp- the, the opening up of subject matter mm. and um, just clarity in your head, it feels like you've, you've just decluttered. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of, um, I really... I I really kind of felt like I um restarted yeah, in man. life um you know and it's just, it's just various things but you know I think the the most liberating thing you can do for yourself is is to is to ex- explore why you are the way if there's anything you don't like about your life you know mm. um some things you have to do as a necessity but you know just just Checking yourself and you know all the rest um, is so important because it, it it has really kind of changed my whole life. Various things, obviously, I've got three kids now and they take up a lot of my time and don't really leave um, much much. What's the word? Devil's Downtime. work for the idle hands. There or whatever. you go. Yeah. That's the so one. that's a big thing. But it, there was a time where I had you know two kids and it was still struggling and still kind of in the old habits and yeah yeah. and like what i really like just the realization you know when i was diagnosed with adhd and furthermore getting like away from that lifestyle of drinking drugs um and i say a lifestyle because some people are okay yeah with doing them and then just get on and they can get on with things right but a lifestyle of drinking drugs where it's See for me, it wasn't. I did. I never had like a, a, a serious habit, you know. Like in my late for twenty five onwards, it was more like like weekends drinking, but then you know Drink getting, on, drop the, getting on the gear Saturdays, and yeah. stuff like that. Um, just not like what everyone considers normal in our culture, yeah, 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 yeah. but it's not that normal. And I think you kind of, uh, if it works for you, it works for you. But I just, you know, once you. If you kind of are honest with yourself, right, and you know that when you're going out on the weekends like that and you're getting on it every weekend and then 
come Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, not only are you not really getting much done, um, depending on what you do, but you're pretty like riddled with like um, self doubt, anxiety, and just negative vibes. Depletion before your week's yeah, even started. Like, you're just pushing yourself back the whole time. Mm. And I think I remember my mum always said to me, it was like, uh, you know, in my, in my mid twenties, and I was kind of early mid twenties, caught in that cycle, very much socially, mm. but like all of my friends were like ravers and always the weekends were always the benders, you know, like, and my mum was just said, she was like, when are you going to like, like knock it on the head? You know, it's not, it's not like good. And I was like, yeah, but I don't really know how to, because all of my friends. The circle you're in. It and yeah. I'd have to kind of like not see all my friends, which, you know, like that kind of, socialising is so much more important when you're younger, that level of it, you know, mm. um, being at the places where everyone is and all of the rest. And and she was like, all right, yeah, I mean, it's up to you. But she was like, don't kid yourself in thinking that you'll ever really get that far in life if you just regularly use, like, drinking drugs. And it just stuck with me because I was like, she's not trying to tell me to stop. She's just telling me the truth, and it was the truth, you know. And from that point on, it was just the kind of like from like twenty five onwards, is a constant like always with it in mind to slow things down. Mm. But it's hard, you know. Like it, I would stop one thing and then start the other thing, mm. you know, because you're self medicating a lot of yeah. the time, and you it's just difficult. We, it, our culture that, that we grow up in, drugs are so normal right entertainment um, culture it's the arts isn't arts, it it's everything yeah, yeah. and you, like it's a process but getting that behind me um having a family to look after um gave me a kick up the ass and understanding a lot of my short short givings the shortfalls shortfall yeah that's yeah. it growing up because when i was kind of diagnosed um with ADD and when I kind of um, did a bit of addiction therapy, all the stuff that they have to explore, you start realizing what it's to do with and why. And that yeah. just really helped me, um, really, really helped me just go, oh, okay. So I was in this kind of cycle and this is why this was happening. This is why I would never see certain things through or chop and change between like, um, business ideas or th this and that or mm -hmm. you know I used to have this thing of just um when the um intensity of what I now know to be like a, a kind of condition yeah would build up or the um intensity of like addiction issues or you know like doing too much partying would build up I would just get my head into these places where I just oh, fuck everything, mm. cancel that. Mm -hmm. This it could it could have been a relationship where you just think because you're not in control really, and you think you constantly tell yourself if you break this all apart or move over there, wow, yeah. that everything's gonna be all right. And mm. I did that endlessly. I went to Bristol. I was like, oh, you know what? I got into university. If I get to university, I'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, I won't be partying that much. And I you just, said you I went just, to New York as well, so that yeah, was, I went to New York for a few months and Amsterdam, like, Amsterdam as well. Amsterdam, yeah. all of these things were really, in hindsight, um, trying to if I change my environment, if I change mm. certain things, everything will be all right. But it's not like that, you know. You need to really like search within yourself. Um, and be comfortable in your own skin and stick with it, persevere with what's in front of you. Because if you can do that, then you can really do anything. Mm. If you always move, if you run away from situations the whole time, which is a very natural response, um, you use kind of like drinking drugs to escape things. You just like, life's just not might not be as fulfilling for you, you know, because yep. you never get to a certain place where going back to you saying how different I am this time from when I saw you last, it's because beautiful I thing. got to a place where I'm like, I now live in the now, you know, I am, you know, persevered with certain things and I'm just, 
you know, like happier as a result. I'm like a happy person. In the past, I wasn't always really very happy. You know, like you might think you are, but you're plagued with too many like your negative thoughts or yeah. things like that. So it's, yeah. um, yeah, I think for me it's, you know, like in my mid, early mid thirties is when I kind of actually, everything I've done growing up has been, you know, amazing and informative and it's all a journey, you know, and maybe I wasn't ever willing to like, confront these things in the past and mm. things happen at the right time for for the right reason you know it shouldn't you shouldn't punish yourself or beat yourself up about things yeah. um but uh yeah i kind of got to a place in my life where i'm like right, you know this is uh, things are under control and then once you're there you, you like you build on it do you know what i mean mm. and like start kind of enjoying challenges i used to shy away from a lot of things if it was just like required too much of my yeah of my spirit or too i know much. exactly what you mean and it's like after i've kind of like got, got on top of my demons now it is like you know i started i always loved watching boxing but i started going to the boxing club and training mm. there and doing that and enjoying the intensity of it and yeah. you know being like putting a, a ring with someone for sparring or anything like that and when you kind of do stuff like that it just increases mm your feeling that you can do no challenge is too tough no challenge is too tough and also like overcoming like hard times tragic events and things like that and mm. you can take that on the chin and bounce back you're stronger as a, as a result mm. you know we all know that like whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger mm. um but it's uh yeah I, I just think as a message i just encourage anyone that's at odds with with their like um, addictions, drink mm. and drugs to to kind of take it, you know, seriously in their own time. But look after yourself, do you mm. know what I mean? Like take time to think about what you would like to do in life. Mm. Um, and when you establish what you would like to do in life and where you would like to be in life, pursue it wholeheartedly because there is no... There's no reason why not. It's only you tell yeah. yourself there's no re there's a reason why you shouldn't or the the do message. You know what I mean? The me you know what? And also, there's people out there that do have these symptoms or do have these addictions. Mm. That their work rate is actually incredible when you think of it. But if you get rid of these demons, get rid of these burdens, these extra mm. layers, you'll go you'll go clear. Go clear because this is this is the thing. It's it's so true. I always was like a seesaw of being hyper productive mm. and driven, whether that's with graffiti or career stuff I'm pursuing, to just like falling off, you know, yeah. and being like, oh, no, no, it's like, I think I need to do something else or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And in reality, the only real reason, I was told I was ADHD by various people, you know, throughout my life, but I put it down to, I was like, the things you're saying there, about my traits, I think is because I'm always using mm. drugs mm. recreationally. Yeah. And if I get rid of that, I'll probably be like smooth sailing, but it wasn't the case. And I got tired of that seesaw of like mm. being really driven on hyperproductive and then crashing mm. when I had kids. And I just realized if I'm going to be like a good dad, I can't fall off. Do you know what I'm saying? I've yeah. got to keep it. I've got to like, yeah, it's no good for me to be all like down on myself and consumed by negative thoughts and turn into drinking drugs when I've got the like demands of of raising children and and the demands of adult life and you know yeah like businesses I was running yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or whatever. So it's um escapism is like a weird thing, isn't it? Because you actually, if you really just channel it into your art and channel it yeah. into the things that are your f f most favorite pastimes yeah. as yeah. opposed to oh that's work that's work yeah remove that no exactly you? and i think if you're in like a uh, you have a low pressure lifestyle it's easy to not address these things and, and i might have never addressed them you know like if i don't know because you can always basically i didn't have the option to go and like um, go on a meditation retreat in Thailand for a month. Do you know what I mean? That's not a happening. trip to Bali. Yeah, like I'm not... Get vegan it, for a bit. Yeah, like you're in it. You're, you're a parent. You've yeah. got these things going on. Yeah. And 
but I would just, yeah, my advice is it doesn't, you don't have to wait until like the pressure's mounting and you've got like excess responsibilities before confronting yeah. it. Because if you confront it before, your life's going to be better. You're going to have a happier life. Do you know what I mean? Thousand so, yeah. wise words, man. Yeah. Words from, a, you know, a, 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 an adult perspective, you know, from a mature mm. perspective. Mm. It's fucking mm. so good. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, now, like, my kind of... Don't get me wrong, I still... you. Everyone has your low points. Every, you know, you experience strange anxiety. But you manage them differently, don't you? And it's more that, like... Like, I've become consistent with my my creative um, output and, and my work rate. And, mm. of course, you still have times where, like, you have a fucking a bad day and shit's, like, p- pissed you off. Or yeah. you, your head can always go down the, the path of yeah, distraction right. and things. But it's, it's no longer, like, a, a seesaw, you know. And I think, yeah, like I say, I think, you know, is, um, some people... Um, might relate to what I'm saying, but be all right not addressing it with like with a doctor or however it is, uh, drug services. Mm. Um, but they might find that they do drift a bit and they do try and run away from things a bit and mm. therefore, you know, building relationships or, or building a career path might... Might not go so smoothly. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. But you know, everyone's everyone's got their own journey, man. Bro, like two hundred and sixty plus podcasts, and I feel like I gain so much by being first hand experiencing conversations like this. And mm. I think conversations as a whole, if you're sitting there on your own and not really thinking things too mm. clearly, mm-hmm. having those conversations. Is everything. Yeah, I mean, you must get to soak up a lot of, you know, like... It's so much human knowledge. Human opinion. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, totally. It's, it's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is an era of conversation. It's an era of You're communication. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, if you, there's, there's there's no better time than yeah. to just jump in and, and yeah, self-assessment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's why I was like, I was really happy that you got back in touch with me because actually over the last year with, with all the coronavirus stuff, is the first time, you know, for loads of us where you have the space to think yeah. and see, actually, that's not right in the world. Or mm. really, like, what we've been talking about now with checking yourself and being kind to what you want in life, everyone was given the opportunity to sit back. and You were forced to sit back and look at things and you have all of your life on the table. Yeah. Post-March 2020, you yeah. had all your life and then after that, your life is all on the, on the table and you can see which parts of it maybe didn't make sense. And there's so many people that have switched careers or moved here or there or whatever. Yeah. And um, I think one thing I really, you know, um, a positive thing from this whole COVID era, what I took from it was I was never, like, increasingly, I wasn't that social, sociable, yeah? Um, because... I've got too much responsibility and in my mind it was just too much of a minefield sometimes like growing up with the people I've grown up with majority of my friends go for a drink with them and it just escalates and do you know what I mean I was like I would definitely like (laughs) always try and meet up with people but it was easier for me to be like you know what like I see people work related things like if you want to create something with me you know like um whatever painting and Mm. stuff like that then that's where i would like catch jokes with people and see friends Mm. but if it was just like really friends that always uh, meet for a pint like i didn't really have enough time for that which sometimes i thought i'd been antisocial but really like this whole era showed me that it's because it, it's too kind of, um, it would lead me down a kind of wrong path sometimes. What happened with like coronavirus, obviously we're all starved of... Um, fun. Of fun, yeah. It's starved <laughs> of um, friendship and shit. And I would have really, really amazing chats with people, like friends yeah. I've known for years, you know, like long like chats. And then it, sometimes I'd be like, 
which I'd never done before. I'd be like, you know what? I'm going to come and see you and we're going to talk about this. And I would go to like certain friends' houses and sit there and like mm. get into a conversation on a topic, yeah? That's probably <laughs> how people were communicating in like the fucking yeah, 1800s. Yeah, 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 like, yeah. let me come and see you and we'll really get into this. <laughs> yeah, like, Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, old school we'll movies. converse, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't even have a chance to communicate for yeah, anything, yeah. but like, yeah. we're going to rock up at this person's house and we're going to talk about like a political issue yeah, yeah, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, send him a letter. <laughs> Would you like to talk about the yeah. <laughs> the state of um yeah, yeah. Like the the, the with a red crest the wax yeah. stamp put yeah, on exactly. it, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, oh, I'm kind coming of, over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I really started embracing like socializing in that way. Yeah. Whereas like like feeding like like our brains. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. and it just seems so much more like important. And I think um this is the first time, you know, like, you've invited me to come and talk. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's just, you know, I feel like I've got more to say now and, and kind of really enjoy the, um, I think there's more meaningful discussions happening these yeah. days, basically, and, and, I, and I get a lot from it. And I think, um, you know, it's great that the pubs are all opening back up again. It's a very important, like, release for people and things like that. It's yeah. part of our culture yeah. and all the rest. But um, I think that the break from all the pubs and clubs has helped a lot of people I know with their um, mm. addiction issues because, you know, even myself, I still like a drink, but at home, you know, just this whole time when pubs are closing, I have like a few beers and then realise that I don't actually want to drink any more than like a few bottles of beer, yeah. which is essentially like one big pint. Yeah, that's together. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then it's like, I'd get used to that and like, understand actually what my body and is, is, the is, kind of is hangover wanting. I can deal with when I've got to get up at like six in the morning with little ones. Um, but the, uh, and I think a lot of people realise that. It's like, yeah, you might have like sniffed coke every weekend, but now there hasn't been any clubs or like pubs that everyone's just loosely socialising and doing yeah. it. Do you still like sniffing coke? Mm. Just you and your mate in the flat, like yeah, yeah. watching on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and it's a lot of people are like, one. no, that's not the one. And then you've got a, you've got this like hangover where there's not even any escape from it. Can't even go and get some fried <laughs> no, breakfast no, there's no or anything. escape. You're just there in your room with there's like... There's no hangover cure no more. You're just stuck in the room being... No, a... exactly. It reduced all of that stuff Wait to exactly Uber what it is <laughs> yeah. and what it does to your body. And so I think like, yeah, they're the space that we've been given... Um, blessed we're very lucky yeah yeah you know obviously a lot of tragedy and it's like hardship involved in it but um i think there is positives mm. to take from, from from all of it man 100 sure yeah, yeah yeah man so what's the future my brother what's the, the future? future um yeah so i'm actually in the process of moving over to, to portugal portugal yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah 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 i'm moving over there yeah bit, um, of, bit of sun bit of retreat yeah yeah, mm. yeah man don't blame um, you, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, I've always wanted to live somewhere else in the world. Never really um, managed to make it happen for one reason or the other. Um, mainly needing to like kind of stay in London to mm. generate work and things like that. But um, yeah, a few things. Got a few things in place. You know, Fucking firstly great. my own my own head, and um, yeah, yeah, giving giving it a go. You know, uh, the kids. My eldest is only five, so he's not old enough to um, complain about getting mm. taken away from his pals in London or anything like that. You know, get some Portuguese, to... you know, build some double yeah, bilingual. Yeah, 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 exactly. All yeah. that good so stuff. All, all of that. Um, so yeah, we'll see where, uh, you know, we'll see where things things take me. But um, and the art, keeping on, keeping on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah, the social like, medias, all the usual yeah, business. Yeah, nothing yeah, changes, yeah, does that, it? Nothing changes, man. You know, like I'm just. Uh, Really happy and very lucky to be in the position. Um, it's, it's you know like it's a mix of things, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I feel very lucky in general to be able to create artwork mm. for for a living day to day. I think if you are able to do that in any level, it's a, it's a success, you know, yeah. to be able to wake up and and kind of um, indulge in that sort of thing. And it's also very important for your own mental health and provides things for for other people. Um, but yeah, going back to to it, it's like um, when things started, you know, moving in the right direction for me, it was like, all right, I didn't see this coming at all. But then, you know, it's actually been doing it for like fifteen years. It's bonkers, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. it's like that's the other thing, man. It's um, yeah, just that perseverance. You know, it's like 
you do hear that a lot from people. Mm. You know, stick with what you're doing. Trust me, stick to your guns. Stick with what you're doing. One day it will like work how you want it to. But like, it really, it really does. And very various factors come into play as to how easy it is for people True. to to do it. Everyone, we're all born into different environments we have different responsibilities yeah. circumstances different privileges mm. and you've got to be aware of that you know mm. you can't be like oh you know i did it so anyone can so many different factors but one thing i have um realized is that it it if you stick with it the chances like the chances of you getting lucky increase and increase and increase and increase because you're you you build armor as you go to take on any storm yes to get to to get lucky you have to put yourself in the position where luck can come your way yeah you know and sometimes sometimes you fall out of luck sometimes you fall out of luck it's a game of chess <laughs> exactly exactly sometimes it goes the other way but you know i just this yeah man i think it's um there's, there's definitely a, a more s supporting um industry i guess for for artists and mm. the, the diy potential of how you can get your stuff across you know um is is good and people should you know like stick stick with it you know um because it's i see a lot of stuff out there now a lot of people doing really good things and um you know i'm sure everyone has that like moments of self-doubt but yeah i think you know just just sticking with what you do even if it's not the end thing hmm. you know own it yeah own it because i don't think you know necessarily what like my my style of art isn't the on trend style of like painting necessarily right it might be to some people but it's something i've always done i've always fucked with the kind of like abstract faces that have a certain like tribal thing a certain 1950s cartoon thing there's been pools of inspiration which i've always used and there's been lots of times where that's not been the, the flavor cool, of the month. The flavor of the month, and the thing is, if something is credible in its own right for its own reasons, and it comes from an honest place mm. and a developed, considered place, at some stage it will be the in thing, whether yeah. it's music or art or whatever you're doing. Because everything's considered. Everything. Yes, because trends come around and come back around and then if you're the person who's been doing that always they go oh or so let's say it's like let's say it's uh skinhead culture or um tattoo rave culture. culture yeah anything right yeah. if you as a photographer all you're ever interested in is rave photography yeah and then it's hard to etch a living out of it um there wasn't always that much of a like scope for big platforms to put you on. Just as an example, might mm -hmm. not even be the best example because no, rave, no, no, right. raves are popular. You yeah. know, they always have been. But there will come a time when the big fashion houses of the world and the big media platforms of the world say, you know what? Like this is British in. rave culture is fucking cool. And that's what we need to look for for inspiration. Who's the photographer that does British rave culture? And then yeah. if you're still doing it, you're that guy who will get, all right, do you want to come and shoot Louis Vuitton's big campaign? Yeah. Mad archive, so they've already got it already yes. backed up, it's all there. Yes, whereas if you are constantly trying to kind of um, please the tastemakers of the time mm. and change... Chasing your tail. Yeah, it depends what you want out of life. Maybe you can always get like some you know commercial work out of it and that's great, but you might not be known for being that person who does that. And mm. I think like with myself it's me going back to making art and using those faces and everything mm. in my paintings and really throwing myself in it's it's kind of stood the test of time and it's it's stuck with people that i'm the person who does that mm -hmm. and if you like that sort of thing i'm the person who does that and i've been doing it for a while so, so you I'm, hear this truth yeah so that's yeah i think i'm yeah, man. That's just, the future. Just, just, just carve your lane and, and stay in it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I'll tell you this much. As a scene and as somebody that is on the outside looking in, your contribution to the scene still holds strong 
and uh, mm, thank you, man. That's, so that means a lot to hear it. We're, lu- we're lucky thank to you. have you, man. We're lucky to yeah, have you. Yeah, no, thanks for having me back, man. You mm. know, it's, um, yeah, it's uh, I just enjoy putting stuff out there. You know, that's the main thing, and um, I think you know with age you understand more why you're doing things. You're less likely to get taken down a path of what's mm. cool at the moment or whatever, you know? And I mm. think I'm at a place where I, I really enjoy putting stuff out into the world and I know that I'll do it forever, you know? That's and right. that's, uh, as long as I'm here, I'll, I'll do that. And, um, you know, if if people enjoy it, then, uh, you know, that's, that's amazing. Because, you know, like I say, I, I really... It's not just... Um, understanding myself and refocusing on my own um, output, I really have learned to enjoy other people's more, mm. you know, because I'm less consumed with other then stuff. ego's gone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, just kind of you get get control of your ego a bit mm. and, it's just, you know, you, you learn to appreciate things more. You don't get so wound up about certain Living things. Living the now a bit more, innit? Yeah, and, like, there's just... There's a lot of people doing really cool things, man, so it's... Um, yeah, even you know, like this platform, having that to is a big contribution, man. And I think um, to encouraging people um, to keep doing what they're doing. Yeah, fair and same. I think you know, there's you're covering a, a really broad range of characters from within street level arts. You know, like that come in and out of like you know, like genres of rap and rave culture and art and tattoo everything and i think like these things are important really really important because you know it's like back in the day with when uk hip-hop scene was thriving Mm. that era of uk hip-hop scene that you know we were both involved in you had hip-hop connection and you had itch fm and you had these things which celebrated a lot of the um grassroots street level people That's right. um, playing a part yeah. um, kung fu and, and I put people on um and i think it's amazing of how uh mainstream let's say like rap has got um in this country in terms mm. of the mainstream acceptance and the platforms that are there you know bbc will now like non-stop like <laughs> yeah. watch, you know, banging that <laughs> yeah just like you know drill yeah. whatever and it's like it wasn't always like that but as things have got mainstream accepted um likewise on the street art front you have the media platform celebrating that the global street artists and the big galleries will will show street art as that's happened the the more kind of street level um people that are really like the backbone mm. of where that can all come from, yep. sometimes don't have a don't have a, pla- a mm. platform, you know, like an official platform. And I think you're building that, you know, it is that. Thank you. And I think it's um something that should be encouraged and continued with, man. Thank you, my yeah, brother. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate because that. because it will it will it will um inspire people to do it. Because if you're just starting out in whatever it is <clears throat> you're doing, and you're watching all of these, you're taking inspiration from different people. The um the understanding that, oh, when, you know, if I keep going at this, maybe, like, I'll be invited on here to mm. talk with you before I'm, like, huge. If I don't, you know, it's... it's, it's you like need a kind of, almost to... like a gateway to, to yeah. the, 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 the place exactly. you want to be. Exactly. Mm. exactly. I like to think so. Oh, I hope so. I yeah, hope, that's yeah. resonate. I hope that resonates yeah. from yeah, my yeah. intentions, man. Yeah. And it's great that you you recognise that. And, and you've come on a second time. I really fucking yeah. value it, brother. Yeah, yeah. It's nice. fucking great. It's good, man. Yeah, thanks for getting me back, like yeah. I say. Um, but yeah, I better actually go. <laughs> I was I'm just thinking about your girlfriend. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Flowers, two hours on it. Yeah. Flowers have <laughs> been sent his way, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you follow all the handles, Mr. Panique. Um, thanks for coming through, my brother. No worries. This is Killer Keller podcast striking again. You're doing over it. Sharon is caring. Don't talk to anyone I don't. All right. Stay lucky, people. Cheers, Panic. Peace. <laughs>